airborne exposure to fine particulate matter, which is otherwise known as PM2.5, negatively impacts hallmarks of aging. And that's what we'll see here. So starting in the middle from PM2.5, we can see that it increases inflammation as evidenced by increases for pro-inflammatory cytokines, including TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta, and IL-6. Exposure, airborne exposure to PM2.5 also increases oxidative stress, as evidenced by increases in oxidative damage to lipids, DNA, and proteins, but also inducing mitochondrial dysfunction. And, and airborne exposure to PM2.5 induces epigenetic modifications, which can determine whether genes are turned on or off. So with that in mind, what's optimal for PM2.5 exposure? So before jumping into that data, let's take a sidestep and properly define what exactly is PM2.5. And that's what we'll see here. So note that PM2.5 are fine particles that have a diameter less than 2.5 micrometers or 2.5 microns. So to put that into perspective, what exactly is a micrometer or a micron? If we divide one meter by a million parts, that would be one micrometer. So PM2.5 would have a diameter of 2.5 micrometers. And some of the particles that are included in this class include combustion particles, organic compounds, metals, and others, which I'll go into deeper detail in a minute. Let's put PM2.5 into perspective by comparing it against other stuff. For example, PM10 are particles that have a diameter of 10 micrometers, and some of those particles would include dust, pollen, and mold. Going higher, we can see that the diameter of a human hair is about 25 to 30 times larger than PM2.5, with a diameter of 50 to 70 micro micrometers. And then, fine beach sand has a diameter of 90 micrometers, so about 40 times larger than PM2.5. All right, so I mentioned some of the sources for PM2.5, but what are other sources of PM2.5? So there are primary sources and natural sources. So first, for primary sources, they include traffic pollution, industrial pollution, but also agricultural, including fertilizer use and crop burning. In terms of natural sources, they include volcanic eruptions, wildfires, and sandstorms. All right, so now that we've defined airborne fine particulate matter, or PM2.5, we can go back to that initial question of what's optimal for airborne PM2.5 exposure. And that's what we'll see here. This is a study of almost 61 million people, and as far as I've been able to find, this is the largest study ever published on this topic. On the y-axis, we've got the hazard ratio, or risk of death for all causes, and then on the X, we've got annual average exposure, airborne exposure to PM2.5. And what we can see is that as PM2.5 increases, that's significantly associated with a relatively higher risk of death for all causes. In terms of lowest risk, that's associated with PM2.5 values that are less than 5 micrograms per cubic meter. So in terms of what's optimal, that's my target. Indoor air quality with a PM2.5 average for the full day, for every day, 365 days in a year, less than 5 micrograms per cubic meter. Now note that we can track PM2.5, and to do that I'm using the Kingping Air Quality Monitor Generation 2, and note that I'm not affiliated, I'm not sponsored, this is what I'm using, there are other products, I'm not here to say that they're, they're the best, but this monitor includes several variables that I was interested in tracking, which is what's shown here including PM2.5, but also PM10. So at some point I could do a PM10 video in terms of how that looks over time. It also includes CO2 carbon dioxide measurements, and that might not seem like a big deal, but my house is pretty tightly sealed, so if I don't properly vent CO2, it will accumulate in the house. And one reason why that's important is because there are a few studies, although there aren't many studies, where elevated concentration, room concentrations of carbon dioxide can negatively impact heart rate variability and resting heart rate. So I'm collecting data to see if that's true or not in my case, so stay tuned for that at some point in a future video. So this air quality monitor also includes variables that I was tracking in Boston, including temperature and humidity. Also, these variables can impact HRV and resting heart rate. Too hot and too cold, but also too humid can potentially impact HRV and resting heart rate, at least in my, in my data. It also includes volatile organic compounds, which are metabolites that are released into the air, for example, by cooking, but also fragrances and laundry detergent, anything that has a smell can be released into the air. 
And last but not least, it also includes noise and decibels. And granted, I'm least interested in tracking that as I, I can hear differences. You know, we can hear differences, whereas sensing carbon dioxide is, is, we can't do that, right? In terms of the goal, the goal is to keep PM 2.5 less than five micrograms per cubic meter all day, every day for a full year. So what does that look like? Let's take a look at a couple days of examples of tracking PM 2.5, with the first day being September 12th through September 13th, as shown here. On the y-axis, we've got PM 2.5, and that's tracking from 6.30 at night on September 12th through 6.30 at night on September 13th. And then in terms of what's optimal, we put a green arrow at that PM 2.5 measurement of 5 micrograms per cubic meter. And then for about a four-hour period on this day, we can see that I was at or above that 5 microgram per cubic meter threshold. So why did that happen? Well, when I turn the bathroom exhaust fan on, that it looks like it leads to a spike in PM 2.5 into the house. And the reason I'm turning the bathroom exhaust fan on isn't just to get rid of humidity in the shower. It's to vent carbon dioxide and VOCs from the house. So my house is pretty tightly sealed, and if I don't turn that fan on to vent to the external air, CO2 and VOCs can accumulate in the house. And we're considering that there is published data, at least for CO2, that it may negatively impact HRV and resting heart rate, I wanna keep CO2 levels relatively low. Now, there is a potential upgrade for the bathroom exhaust fan, and that's an energy recovery ventilator, which is known as an ERV. But I, I got a price quote for this and it was $5,000. So I'm not sure it's worth the cost to have a few hours of PM 2.5 spike or potentially spike. This effect doesn't happen every day, although it happens consistently as we'll see. So for now, I'm sticking with the lower budget option of just replacing the bathroom exhaust fan and having a small spike for PM 2.5 relative to the $5,000 or potentially more ERV, which to be totally honest, I don't know if that would do anything in terms of PM 2.5. Maybe I'd have the same, same issue. Now, when I turn the bathroom exhaust fan on, we can see that PM 2.5 quickly comes down back to almost zero. And at other times, when I turn the fan on, we can see that there's, there were spikes, albeit smaller spikes. And when I turn the fan off, PM 2.5 comes down. So this is a pretty consistent effect where I'm venting CO2 and VOCs to the outside, but for whatever reason, the, there's an increase in fine particulate matter that's coming back through the fan into the house, which is a drawback. Fortunately, though, when the windows are closed, we can see that PM 2.5 in the house is almost completely non-existent, which helps bring the full day average to far below five. It's actually about less than two micrograms per cubic meter. All right, so this is one day. So let's take a look at another example, September 14th through September 15th, as shown here. And then we'll put up a green line at that five microgram per cubic meter threshold cutoff. Remember, I wanna to try to stay below that every day for a full year. And then we can see a couple of big spikes. In fact, the spikes here are larger than they were on the previous slide, such that at one point, PM 2.5 went to higher than 10 micrograms per cubic meter. Now, when I turn the bathroom fan on at another point in the day, granted there was a smaller spike, but still almost as large as what we saw on the previous day. And then with the bathroom exhaust fan off, we can see that PM 2.5 quickly came down. So this is clearly a bathroom exhaust fan story. And I should mention, I haven't shown it here, but the bathroom exhaust fan is doing a good job of venting CO2 and VOCs to the outside air. So this isn't a net negative. You know, I'm getting a reduction in CO2 and VOCs, but unfortunately an increase in PM 2.5 on most days when I'm turning that bathroom exhaust fan on. Here too, though, fortunately, when the window was closed, we can see that PM 2.5 in the house is almost non-existent, at most one microgram per cubic meter. So this is great news because, again, it helps keep that full day average below that five microgram per cubic meter threshold. If you've ever wondered what's optimal for biomarkers, well, I have a new Patreon tier dedicated specifically to that. It currently includes the 35 biomarkers shown here in more than two hours of video content, 52 published references, and note that these aren't the reference ranges which you can get from any LLM these days. It's what may be optimal based on how each of these biomarkers changes during aging and or their associations with risk of death for all causes. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And I also post at least twice per day in five different Patreon tiers. So if you're interested in checking out my attempts to slow aging, check us out there. We've also got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that help support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests done, the clearly filtered water filter, which I use every day, 
at-home metabolomics, I'm up to 20 tests, or microbiome composition, NED testing with Ginfinity, epigenetic testing with True Diagnostic, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes the best epigenetic clock of epigenetic clocks, GrimAge, green tea, which I drink every day, diet track and chronometer, also using it every day, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, including Data is my North Star, which I've got on here, Figuring Stuff Out is my drug, and the Conquer Aging or Die Trying channel logo. If you're interested in that, check it out. Link in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.